Anyhow, we can wait for the projection and I will ask you some questions which are quite interesting. Mm. Could you make a distinction or explain the difference between philosophy and psychology, for example? We never thought of these things, but it is a very interesting exercise. There is a psychology and there is a philosophy. What is the difference? Now you will be applying your consciousness to these faculties. Exactly. You will be looking into the difference of application of these faculties. Is philosophy the way human beings behave and psychology how the human being uses his brain? Well, I heard the same definition. Uh, sorry? How they behave and how they but use their brain is the same. Is the behavior of human beings? Philosophy is the behavior of human beings. The study of the behavior of human beings? It is psychology, as I described. Psychology? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about definitions. Philosophy is about definitions. Nice. Right. This is about philosophy, I think. Right, absolutely. It's about vaster questions of existence in general, not only human existence, no human behavior. It's evaluating life. Evaluating life. Koran. Evaluating life. <laughs> Beautiful. You always bring some deep insights. Yes, please. Psychology is a social science, and that is science of the mind. Interesting. And then this is very, very close. All these definitions are good, because they are kind of showing the shades of the same. But somebody else, something else, there is, there is more, much more. Right, purpose. Okay. And philosophy? <laughs> no, no, but your difference, your difference, you are very right. It deals with evaluation of our... Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So you've got very limited time. Do you really understand where you are? Right. Uh, it's a very elaborate answer. <clears throat> the difference on um, more more subjective, more to the to the very point. Very very nice. Thank you for this long answer. But uh, it, it gives us a sense of evaluating the qualities, the inequalities, evaluating the ideas through our psychological perception, and so on. Um, please don't break. And, uh, yes, please. Psychology could be something like uh, like where we are born, physical, mental, or social beings. So it is like it is not something that we can take it for granted. Like everybody has a psychology, and philosophy is something that is up to you as a person if you want to question life. And uh, it's not something that is like forced upon you. It's like everybody can. Very nice. So one is forced upon you, other is not forced upon you. One is about you subjectively. Other is not about you so much subjectively, but about objective, bigger, some independent world. Very nice, please. Uh, philosophy is the principle, the knowledge. Um, psychology is the practice. Psychology is? The practice. The practice. Very nice. And philosophy? It's a principle. Principle. Or a knowledge. Very nice. Practice, practice and principle. Please go ahead. I think philosophy is a, a search for what could be, you know, like, um, like shooting in the dark, uh, and psychology is what is. And it is probably evaluated. And uh, the philosophy is the possibility of what could be like. Very nice. So, so psychology is about inner, and philosophy is about what is there and not totally here, but also maybe here, but it's not the focus. The focus is everything. Very nice. Very good. Abstract and practical, concrete, very concrete, subjectively concrete, which is closest to myself and which is farther from myself. And that's why it, how it becomes abstract. Nice. Thank you. These are good definitions. All of them are valid. We will now look into the... Yeah, please. I see the difference in methods because uh, psychology is uh, <coughs> making surveys and uh, looking at people's behavior. Uh, and philosophy is about the questions. All right. Interesting. Yes, it's about subjective experience of people and other is about what is as such beautiful ontological questions what it is as such and the psychological is less ontological yes you want to say more epistemological <laughs> you don't say it but you suggest it very nice very interesting idea didn't have this before but <clears throat> But we can gather, gather these ideas because all of us know about it already. You see, we are kind of delayed with the picture, but it will come. All right, very nice. What is the difference between a psychological approach and philosophical approach? If you would think psychologically, or speak psychologically, or view something psychologically and philosophically, when you become a philosopher, you would deal differently about these two approaches, definitely, yes? Psychologically, you would think about how it is touching you, how it is relevant to you, you personally, subjectively, individually, and philosophically, what would you do? Psychologically, the answer will be more direct, and with uh, philosophy, you question things. For example, if you have a dog, as a philosopher, you say it's a matter. It's not like you won't say it's a red color ball. Like you would say it's matter or something. You go much more deep. Yeah, you go. You go into concepts. You go into ideas, which manifests this world. Very nice. Somehow, <clears throat> we have to shift to that closer table.
So we prepared our ground already. It's kind of interesting. It is visible. <laughs> so here we can see. Here we can see a uh, uh, which explains to us something very interesting about the faculties before we... Presentation. Presentation. Thank you. Right. So here we have this uh, relation to the faculties. So we have self-knowledge, which is active and subjective from one side and perceptive and objective from another side. So we, if it is subjective, it is that some jhana which is holding the image of things and identifying with ourselves. We have a perception of it by feeling because we're holding the self within our own self, appropriating it, making it our own, and by that we know it. And this is the major faculty of the mind to concentrate on the object of sense and to hold it within our consciousness in order to know it. It's appropriation. It's not knowing yet. It's not understanding. It's only apprehending. Apprehending and making it a part of our own identity, our own self. Then when we view it objectively as such, not as an appropriation, not as a part of our own self, but as a different self, objective self, we examine it, look at it as such, not in relations to us, not through us, but as such. Then we see it objectively. This would be perceptive or objective self-knowledge. It's also apprehensive. It's not yet comprehensive. We don't understand what it is, but we know that it is different from us. And we recognize the difference from us. Then we have that relational knowledge, or knowledge through relation, through, I put spirit and self, Atman and Brahman here, but this knowledge relation is comprehensive. So hearing would be to hear about things, for example, oh, yes, in the same story, we hear that which is going beyond what we see. For example, very uh, trivial example, you see the face, and face is behind the glass. You already see the face, have direct contact, look into the eyes, but it wants to tell you something, and you don't hear what it tells. It tries to communicate, but you don't hear. Now, you have a direct contact, what more you want to have, but it seems that we don't hear what self wants. That which falls into domain of want, of something which is beyond what we see immediately, which falls into the domain of intention, which is not here, but must be here because self wants it, belongs to this comprehensive domain. We look at the thing, we don't see what it does until it does it. When it does it, we gather comprehensive understanding of it, what it does, how it can be used. This, how it can be used, goes beyond that what we see now. I didn't click on it. When I start clicking and start changing, 
you will say, ah, this is a clicky thing. But when you look at it without being used, you do not know, it goes beyond the apprehensive immediate cognition. Yes, right. Um, there, there's a simple, very simple example that we probably have all become familiar with, but I especially have become familiar with it because I made it an object of study. If you're in a classroom with students and you ask the students to read a story on their own and they read the words on the page and they finish the story and you ask them what they have read and they may have some vague notion about it. But if you read that story aloud, and if, if you verbalize it, you know, if you, if you introduce the story through speaking and hearing, the comprehension will be absolute. There will be no question about who those characters are and, and what has happened in that story. Very nice. And so we, this chart would mean something entirely different to us if we were just looking at it with our eyes. The, the value that you give it by making it an oral uh, uh, awareness makes an enormous amount of difference. But we, we don't always notice that, but it's, a, it's always true. Well, there is even more simple example. You come to the, some unknown town, you go and there is a palace on the top of the hill, or fortress. You come there, you see everything, you see the rooms, the chairs, the furniture, you know, all these weaponry and all these things. But you do not know to whom it belongs, why it is there, what is the history behind it. So there is somebody coming and telling you the story that in 1700 there was a king. His name was, and it was his cloth, and it was his sword, and everything comes to life. This is comprehension. It's not visible without word. You can have apprehensive touch, but you cannot know what it means. So it has to go farther, beyond, into the history, into the timeline, into the past and the future. And in the space, it's a much vaster space. So it's very clear, but what about the perceptions? We are constructed all the time. We are free uh, by yourself. But what about the perception? How do you do? Do you see how comprehensive? I can't hear you. This, this is so noisy. Hi. Uh, what about the perceptions? So, what about them? Yeah because it looks like it's between the apprehensive and the comprehensive because, uh, you know, we are construction all the time uh, between the information we catch by the sense and the experience which we have. Right. I, I don't get the question, but uh, is that a question? Yeah. When okay, you, you, you put seeing uh, in the in the file of apprehensive, uh, maybe you lose we uh, construction what we see in the same time when when we see. Right. Okay. Perception. perception. You want me to define the per perception to the to the in connection with apprehension? Yes. Yeah. Sometimes you can see directly, but it's, I think we are not educated for to see directly. We always put our information between the perceptions, with the perceptions, sorry. Uh, perception is the, mm, the word which is used... Mm -hmm. yeah. Define the apprehension. Can I, can I intervene? Yeah, please. I think that what you're, the terminology that you're using here um, in this terminology, apprehension means perception. Um, it means that the senses have grasped something which is there, and that which, it, which the senses have grasped is 
known to our awareness. We are aware of the senses having grasped the thing which is there. If it was just the senses, then there would be no grasping. But then in fact, the senses are a, a tool of the mind to grasp what is there. So when you grasp what is there, you're apprehending what is there. And in that definition, there's no difference between perception and apprehension. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the prajnana and the samjnana, for me, are words which mean perception. Mm -hmm. And the word which means uh, comprehending in, in that uh, Western terminology are words like cognizance and conceptualization. So when we become cognizant of that which has been apprehended and we have a con concept of it, it means that we have comprehended it. Mm. That's how I understand the relationship between those terminologies. Right. When I put active and perceptive in the Vivi scheme, I meant two movements. One is more proactive from our consciousness and other is more perceiving. That means receptive rather than perceptive. This was my usage. So we are receiving. Seeing and hearing is a receiving more than acting. Uh, and that's why perceptive. We can be either active, I was talking about this before, or perceptive. We can't be both. It's difficult for us to be both. That's why we developed uh, these uh, methods of yoga, where we become less active in order to be more perceptive to the inner self. So we become less active, then we can go, we can dive deep. But when we are active, very much, we can't be perceptive we lose the perception. So, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's not the perception per se, but perception is a very good defined by that It is apprehensive consciousness, cognition. Cognition, cognizing the thing. Cognizing not in a sense of understanding, but cognizing that it is there, the availability as something different from you, something different from other things, but it is related to you because you hold intention, you, you concentrate on it. So you, it falls into your field of concentration. So the mind is holding, as Shubhendra says, the major faculty of the mind is concentration. It is holding it long enough that our other faculties may understand it. Understanding always follows. The concentration precedes. You see, you even if you change your look, I was giving this very interesting example. If you change your glance from one object to another, just try. You will see a delay in focus. Even that. It is there already, but you yet you have to take time to gather it into focus, to hold it. Once you hold it, it's not that you understand what you see. Understanding follows. Comprehension follows. It takes time. Comprehension is always delayed. Apprehension is first, comprehension is next. Sometimes it is opposite, but it's also interesting that you, you comprehend first and then you see the thing. You feel the meaning descending upon you first, and then you create the thing. You create the apprehensive uh, form. But truly speaking, usually it is other way around, in the normal perceptual way. We perceive things, and then we understand what we perceive. Conceptualize. Yes? I think we are apprehending all the time. For example, I might see the project but I have to go beyond to know what it is to reach the conclusion. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so in, in Hegelian philosophy, it's immediate awareness and then mediated awareness. Uh, but I would like to, I would like to just put all of this in, in the category of. Um, 
our, observ our observing how our minds work. That's what's important. And it doesn't have to correspond to this terminology or that terminology or some other terminology. In fact, it's better if we don't stick on any particular terminology, in my view. What's necessary is that we observe these processes in ourselves and we discriminate so that we know how we know anything. And we need to come to that understanding. And this, the purpose of this epistemology, I think, is to stimulate us to think and to observe how we know things. Um, I will continue. Um, this uh, speaking is a subjective relation language. So I express myself in a subjective way to communicate something of myself. It's kind of obvious. I am speaking because I want to communicate something of my subjective state of being. My feelings, my thoughts, my state of being, my doubts, my fears, whatever it is, I will express them. This expression of my subjective state is speech, word, which is communicated. This communication on the active subjective side creates something on the perceptive objective side when it is received, heard. And this communication is building up the whole social structure. It is through the word and through this self-expression that the whole social structure is built. Moreover, there is one more level, manifestation knowledge, which is representational. It's already on the level of this uh, embodied being, where the feeling the subjective self-image or object of sense is becoming of, uh, yeah, uh, becomes um, a subjective self-expression in terms of embodiment, in terms of form, beauty, uh, feeling, and so on, which is embodied then in the objective sense of the thing, as a, which we can be touched, can be distinguished from other things. I don't want to stay, stay on it long because there are several slides of that importance um, which we have to go through. So if you look at this next slide, mm, we will see that we need also, I will skip this one and go to the next. Okay, you're right, you're right. Mm. Okay, I will go to the next slide. This we will be examining now in a minute. Um, if we examine what are these uh, approaches to knowledge, why they are needed in our life, we can see that the uh, philosophical approach, if we start with it, to knowledge, uh, is something very fundamental to our nature. Uh, everyone has to have a metaphysical picture of the world, some metaphysical picture as a system of mental views or beliefs and metaphysical paradigm. Uh, it includes a hidden hierarchy of understanding of what is first and what is next, what is important and what is less important, and how it constitutes one reality without which the reality cannot be approached in a rational manner. So it's like a mosaic of all things connected in a meaningful fashion because we got it from our childhood. We got it from our stories which mothers read us when we were children. We got it later in the schools, in the kindergartens. We built up a metaphysical picture of the world. Whatever it is, materialistic, uh, spiritualistic, religious, somebody comes from a, a Muslim community, he believes in one metaphysical world, uh, other comes from materialistic world, believes in another world. Everybody has his metaphysical paradigm, overview of the world, how it is. Everybody has to have it for the mental beings, for us as human beings. Psych psychological approach, everyone has to know oneself to a certain extent and to have a certain personal attitude towards the world. 
and oneself. This knowledge of oneself is not in full accordance with one's own metaphysical paradigm. There is a clash between the two. There is a constant ongoing interaction between the two, which correlates, corrects, and even changes the mental picture of the world, and vice versa. The metaphysical picture can change our psychological attitude. Is it not so? It is going on. Today you heard a Vedic vision paradigm, and you are changed beings, all of you. You are no more the same. Your psychology has changed at once because you saw the meaning of how we are constituted. It gave you some entry to some deeper perception of yourself and evaluation of yourself. So, it corrects and even changes the mental picture of the world and vice versa. Without it, the reality cannot be approached in a truthful, sincere manner. We cannot do it if we are not sincere to what we want to know. I will just go through these one by one and then come back to the major scheme. Philological or linguistic and sociological approaches. Philological approach to knowledge, word, language. Everyone has to use some language. Outwardly or inwardly, even if we speak nothing, we will be formulating something in ourselves. To express, we need to express ourselves through some language. It's not necessarily verbal language. It's not necessarily words. It can be gestures. It can be music, art, dancing. It can be anything. Look. Look is also language. Hmm? I look. All these gestures. Hmm? language. I say something by it. To become conscious of our speech as an expression of oneself, ourselves. And language is a system of mental categories by which we think. To know how, we, how they function is indispensable for building a metaphysical picture of the world in the first place and understanding ourselves psychologically. How our thoughts and feelings relate to our speech faculty and how it influences them. Without it, no serious research is possible in any field and the reality cannot be dealt with in a correct, precise manner. We need this faculty of speech to be very precise, to sharpen our approach. Philosophical or psychological, or sociological. Sociological approach to knowledge. One has to know one's roots, history, religion, social and national heredity. What state one belongs to, what nation, what community, etc. To know one's own past, in order to understand one's present and future. This knowledge is wider than our individual psychological or even philosophical paradigm. It's vaster. It introduces knowledge about relations in time and space beyond our reach. It draws our consciousness to a larger reality of community, country, earth, and finally to the universal and cosmic existence. It brings the aspect of the spirit into picture, a larger reality inside and outside ourselves. It indicates a unifying phenomenon of space and time in which we all live. Without this knowledge, man will not be able to understand fully the growth and the purpose of his life. Makes sense. Is it not so? Oh, it is too many words. Too many words. 
And the last two, I will read them, maybe it's too much. Hmm? Hmm? Bearable? Artistic approach to knowledge. It is a refinement of all our activities. And this is beautiful. This is for musicians, artists, all those who are seeking to express beauty in, in themselves and this life. It is a refinement of all our activities in life in its aspect of beauty, harmony, and perfection. It is what the Spirit has already manifested, conquered, so to say, in life as a result of a long period of evolution. It is what makes us cultured. It is the aim of creation and it is its path to develop ourselves fully individually and collectively we have to learn to manifest beauty and harmony of the spirit to seek after it to embody it i think this is the reason of all these faculties this is the key of the subjective expression and scientific approach the last one the knowledge of matter is indispensable for the understanding of manifestation. All the changes, philosophical, psychological, philological, social, cultural, are possible only in matter. Matter is the foundation and embodiment of any change. It is fixing everything to certain stability so that another change can take place. If matter would not be able to fix it, the next step would have no meaning, for it would have no ground to manifest a new change. I will tell you in a simple word, my intuition, which I'm using as an example, very interesting. I left, and it was with me in my life, I left my motorbike outside in the evening, and in the morning I woke up and I looked through the window and motorbike was in the same place. What a surprise, I thought I, I thought. Look at this. I left it in that place and it waited. It stood in the same place waiting for me to move it again. This is the material creation. It holds every change that next change can take place and will become meaningful. Otherwise, there will be only flux. There will be nothing to develop. If matter would not fix change, there would be no development possible. Makes sense, no? It always fixes change. It resists change. But that's how change is possible. This is the dialectics of change in matter. Without matter, all these approaches make no sense. They are all for one and only reason, to embody the spirit, to make it material. So if all these psychological, philosophical, sociological, linguistic, artistic would not be in matter, they would make no sense. They would not be there. Now, this is the scheme I want to look at it into. So, if you look at psychological approach, and I'm writing here, it's self subjective self-knowledge. Is it not so? Can it be defined as a subjective self-knowledge, psychological approach? No, subjectively I know myself in this way, right? What can I do? It's not an objective knowledge, it's only subjective. But if I know my self-knowledge objectively, it would be philosophical approach. Philosophy is also self-knowledge, but objective. How things are universally existing, not only in myself subjectively, but other selves as they are. That vision. Many times the consultant ask, what is your vision of your company? What is your philosophy? And these are synonyms, philosophy and vision. And relation knowledge. Subjective relation knowledge is linguistic approach, the expression in word. 
an objective is sociological or historical approach. Sociology. A bigger body of selves living together in a meaningful way, developing in a meaningful way. Sociological is rather on the scale of space and historical on the scale of time. Overview on the scale of space and time, which is going beyond ourselves. Moreover, the linguistic approach creates exactly this objective social culture. Self-expression subjective creates an interaction, communication in the social organism and creates social organism and values in this society. Manifestation knowledge subjective is an artistic approach. Subjective manifestation knowledge, bringing beauty, feeling, harmony in yourself, creating a form, envisioning a form, seeing the picture, hearing the music before it is embodied in the physical form, and then embodiment of it in matter, in material form, in terms of literature, poetry, music, art, architecture, and so on and so forth. Make sense? No close, it's approach. Notice, we are changing language. We are not saying this is psychology. We are speaking about psychological approach to knowledge. We are speaking about philosophical approach to knowledge. We are extracting the essence out of it. We are not talking about the domain as philosophy today or psychology, biological behaviorism. We are not looking into this either. We are extracting the very essence of our psychological approach. We are looking for this rather than describing the domains. From a hierarchical point of view, this should be reversed from scientific coming to pass. Okay, you can, you can reverse it, but it, they will be the same. I don't mind reversing. I don't mind putting anything in between or opposite way. Or some people say that linguistic and sociological should be higher. I don't mind. But if there is an order, self, relation, and manifestation. Yeah? Self, relation, manifestation. Makes sense. And now, if you look at these domains and approaches, we will find that psychology can be a domain and psychological can be an approach. So psychological approach to psychology domain will be psychology, basically. <laughs> but psychological approach to philosophy will be psychology of philosophy. Or psychology of language or linguistics. <coughs> psychology of history. Psychology of art. Psychology of science. These all subjects, if you Google them, you will be surprised that they are all there. They are all taught in the universities. We never thought of them that they are all falling in these kind of clear domains and approaches which are determined by our faculties. The most the beautiful thing of this is that our faculties are standing behind them and determining our approaches. So it becomes totally subjective. We are totally involved in this study. It is all our subjects. We cannot, you know, we cannot say that my subject is only psychology. It can't be true. Your subject is psychology of philosophy, psychology of language, psychology of history, psychology of art, psychology of science, and then philosophy of psychology, language of psychology, history of psychology, art of psychology, and science of psychology. If you are psychologist, that means you cover all the domains from one particular approach, psychological. But can you imagine you go from all approaches and you all develop all of them in yourself? Philosophy of language, philosophy of art, philosophy of history, 
history of philosophy, history of psychology, history of art. These are well-known subjects. What, what I want to say is that you, we can learn to be psychologists, philosophers, in a different way, engaging our faculties, refining them, looking how they work, building in us these approaches, making them active, activating them. And then with this mind and difference of them, we can read any of this literature and we will be at home, totally. And I can show you, if you are interested later, it's a little bit mental approach, but it is very interesting to take literature and to read and to see how these approaches change. Philosophy, psychology. Yes? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, there is uh, Lots of people here. can you use mic? We cannot hear you. Science of art. Science of art does not exist in this form. Until now, maybe we could invent it as uh, science of art is concerned with the history. It's history of art. Or with the cons conservation of art. But as such, uh, I don't think that this domain exists. I know science of art, you just Google it. And you will see, <laughs> see million hits in all the universities. Yeah, enough and Googling. It is... <laughs> just so... It's interesting, really interesting. We think that it, it is not there, but, but nauka iskustva, I'm sorry, it's in Russian, it's a very well known subject. This is looking at the scientific approach to art. That means that any time that anybody has used the scientific method to inquire into art, that's their scientific approach to art. So when people do qualitative research study about artists, about artists learning, about artist perceptions of the world, whatever the case may be, it's a scientific inquiry into the domain of art. And then can you explain also the artistic approach to science, which often I don't think a scientist have really have that eyes look at science. And maybe this new level of science. Well, I think, you know, I think again, which I think that's a good point which Lato makes, some of these connections are more established than others. This is definitely true. And I think that the art of science and the science of, of art of, you know, these are two domains which have not, where there has not been as much kind of relation. But it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. There are plenty of artists who have taken on a very scientific approach. I think even, it, it, certainly as far back as the Renaissance and probably preceding that by a long period. There is a whole area called art of science. And that really is, uh, there's a whole area called art of science and it is developing more and more. The idea is that so many scientific theories are driven by an aesthetic understanding, sense of beauty. And Einstein talks about it at great length. That's how many, how he was, his equation, the great equation E equals empty square, was driven by a sense of beauty. And when he saw it, he saw that it could not be anything but this, this idea. So beauty, and in the grandest, grandest sense of the word, exalting sense of the word, has been at the core of many of the scientific theories and ideas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It makes totally sense. All these equ equations in mathematics, they also feel them as beautiful. They look at this and say, oh, this is beautiful, must be true. You know? But we don't have that sense, yeah? because we don't deal with mathematics, and we think that art is only some feeling. But there is feeling also in this scientific field. There is feeling of beauty and harmony. There must be. These are approaches. These are not the sciences we know it. It is not that what we think about these domains. These are our faculties which we cannot reduce. They are irreducible faculties of our consciousness. We will recreate these sciences whether we want it or not. I'm giving you that look, uh, yeah. Vladimir. I am yeah, finishing my presentation. Thank you. 
Is it? Uh... I I'll let you first finish. I want to refer back to what you say about uh, when um, Matthew mentioned about this in the Renaissance time, the Da Vinci, those those inventors, scientists of those times, they are also simultaneously philosophers and artists. Apparently, this integral conscience, consciousness and the integral faculties, they are far integral those years than we are all modern education made of who we are. The same, I myself am from China. In ancient China, the Chinese scientists are also the artists, are also the philosophers. They express this into, they could express this integral consciousness through art, through poetry, like Lao Tzu, Confucius, through also the Chinese landscape paintings. So this is exactly the purpose, I think, of your exploration, is one to help us to come back to the source of this overall wholeness of our development and of our faculties. And they say, scientists only science. They know nothing about art. They do not have conversation with artists, you know? And they are so insist on their own approach to, to sing the feel that is the only true way of looking at the world, which is not true. She's right, she's right. Thank you, Tom. People know nothing about imagination. It is the most mysterious character. <laughs> okay, so... I know when I first had this conversation with, uh, with Vladimir, it was quite mind-altering for me. It's quite, a, quite a, a lot of information and quite a shift in perspective to consider. So while uh, Rod is, is setting up to elaborate a little bit more on applications in the field of education, let's just take a minute just to reflect on on this piece and what that means and how that, that shifts the way that we think about um, the integral paradigm of knowledge. Let's just take two minutes.